Good morning, my friend, or greetings. <laughs> Gonna catch this bus here again. I'm always riding buses, it seems like, because I don't drive anymore. I'm actually uh, street preaching and ministering on the streets, all these different cities and towns and locations without an automobile, private vehicle. So I use the public transportation here. And fortunately, I'm in a city or a town that has extremely well maintained uh, public transportation. It's absolutely fantastic. Plus, uh, the Lord put me only a few blocks down the road here uh, in Old Boulder, which I'm, so it's only a 10 minute walk up to the bus station here. This is a Boulder bus station here. Uh, there's the bus to Denver there waiting. A bunch of buses just took off. The airport bus just took off a second ago where they keep bicycles here. And uh, this is the bus going over to Longmont. So we're gonna catch the bus, go to Longmont and preach. Uh, uh, we'll see what happens, right? All right. God bless you, man. See you over there. Good afternoon, my friend. Welcome to Longmont, Colorado. Cheers. So it's another hot day. It was freezing a few days ago, and now it's a hot, blistering, cold, hot, blistering day. That's great, right? So I'm a little later than normal. Hallelujah for that. Because, uh, God bless you, Todd. Because there's a lot of people who uh, uh, want to rush and want to push the Spirit. But we have to sometimes wait upon the time of the Lord. You have to wait upon the peace. You have to wait upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Because, whoa, very windy today. I'm not going to be able to lift the banner. It's 20 plus mile an hour winds all day today. I'm sorry. I'm outside. <laughs> it wasn't windy for a second. But, uh, so, uh, anyways, uh, just be patient with the Lord. Uh, you just can't run out and push. If you're always pushing, if you're always pushing, 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 uh, you're going to burn yourself out. Uh, I'm a long haul trucker for 40 years, and if you pushed all the time, uh, you'd burn yourself out. That's why I had such a hard time in the first many years of trucking because I pushed. I'm, you know, that's the type of person I am. I can click into that driving mode, driver mode, uh, and uh, just push. And, uh, and not sleep, not eat, just go, 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 go. And uh, in the trucking business, 40 years in the trucking world, uh, I burned out a couple times. And even in the ministry, uh, pushing hard in the ministry. And uh, I remember back, uh, way back, when I was all about performance. Uh, it wasn't about faith, it wasn't about following God, it's about performance, getting the job done, you know. <laughs> And uh, so I come from a lot of different perspectives. Uh, I just didn't start doing it, being a minister just the other day or last week or last year. I've been doing this for a very long time. And uh, if you've been, been doing something for a very long time, you've had ups and downs, you've had plateaus, you've had mountain top, mountain top experiences, you've had uh, low valley experiences, you've had rough times, you've had great times. Uh, you've had all kinds of seasons in your life. Uh, but when you just began ministering or, or just thinking about getting to be, be a minister, uh, you're looking at the season that you're currently in. 
Uh, but us guys who are, are old, <laughs> 68, and uh, uh, have been serving the Lord a long time, uh, we're not looking from our current perspective. And uh, we're looking from a long-term perspective. That's why I can commit to 10 years of being on the street preaching every day, six days a week for 10 years. Uh, to somebody that's 20 years old, that's like, they can't even conceive of dedicating 10 years of six days a week on the pre on the street, preaching every day, six days a week. You know, I'm putting in eight, uh, eight nine, 10 hours, sometimes 12 hours, sometimes 14 hours a day. But I'm averaging right around 55 to 60 hours a week in the ministry. That's a lot of hours, like last night. I, you know, I didn't get to bed till 1, 1.30 last night. And I couldn't, you know, I slept hard. It was 9.30 when I finally woke up. And I just couldn't get moving. It took me a couple hours just to wake up because I was exhausted. Louisville became, I laid, I stayed longer than normal in Louisville. A lot of great things happened in Louisville yesterday. Let me set this coffee down. And so, you just don't jump out of bed and take a shower and run out the door. Uh, I could have done that, and when you're young in the ministry, you would probably have done that. But when you're older in the ministry, you realize that it's all about your heart with God, so your fellowship, it's your communion with the Lord. It's all about waiting upon the Lord. It's all about not living in the storm, but living in peace. And if I wanted to go under the storm, make something happen, let's say, uh, I would have just jumped out of bed, took a shower, jumped on the bus and came to Longmont, and I would have been just beat up all day long. It would have been really a hard day for me. Is this coming in all right? <laughs> the sun, the shade. I'm trying to stand under this uh, shade sort of. I'm gonna stand right out there in the hot sun. It's 81 degrees today with the high wind. So understanding that helps us in our ministry. Understanding peace, understanding uh, timing, understanding that uh, you just can't, like I said, jump up and take a shower, run to Longmont and start preaching. Uh, you, you have to spend time with the Lord. God knows what time you went to bed. God knows what time you're gonna get up. God knows, God's watching. He's not a, he doesn't turn a deaf ear or a blind eye to us. Uh, he's always with us, God is with us all the time when we're sleeping god is with us god is with us and understanding that uh, helps us and what i mean by help us is we it brings our it brings understanding to our relationship with with god by the spirit of god it helps our relationship because when you understand who you're with it's easy to kind of go with them it's when they uh, when they're feeling kind of funny, you feel kind of funny. When they're feeling happy, you're feeling happy. It's, you know, it's kind of like a, a long-term marriage. When you've seen somebody married for 30, 40, 50 years, they, they, they look alike, they talk alike, they walk alike, and they, they have the same moods. Uh, if you're a father or you're a mother, I mean, obviously a mother, but if you're a father, uh, if you've bothered children, uh, when you're wife is going through that pregnancy uh, you feel like you're uh, going through it with her you know if you're involved in her mar in, in, in that relationship if you, does, if you don't care then you don't understand it but I was involved in my marriage I was involved in my children and uh, I felt the same thing she felt seems like I mean we went through all the Lamaze classes and we had a natural childbirth both child and uh, uh, when she gave birth it felt like I gave birth I mean it was like it exhausted me you know, I was wore out, beat up, you know, for nine months, I guess, and after the delivery. But that's because I was in tune with my wife. I was walking with her. I wasn't walking against her. I was walking with her. However, now listen to this. I'm going to have one more little caveat there. Because if I stopped there, you wouldn't know the rest of the story. Now, you go forward from that. See, that was, uh, that la our last child was born in 1984. God bless you, Nicole. And uh, Johnny was born in 81. So uh, God bless you, Johnny. Uh, April 28th is my son's birthday. Hallelujah for Johnny. Uh, he's over in North Carolina. Uh, and uh, he's a good man. So both my children were uh, received Jesus Christ when they were four years old. They went forward at an altar call in church uh, on their own. 
mom and dad were sitting in the chairs and they asked if they could go forward. They're, four, they're three or four years apart, three and a half years apart. And uh, so it wasn't, and both of them at four years old. So Johnny at four years old went forward and then three and a half years later, Nicole at four years old, both received Christ. That's pretty amazing. And they're still saved today, you know. They're, you know, Johnny is, you know, 40 something and Nicole is 30 something. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're both still saved. They're both still loving Jesus. They're, they've never, uh, so they, that was a real salvation. That was a real uh, renewing of, uh, that was real. It wasn't, it was real. And uh, it's a great testimony for us. But when you're, but uh, here's the rest of the story. So, uh, uh, one day, uh, should I tell the story? Okay. So this is kind of a rough story here. You, you guys might not relate to this. That's okay. But uh, so my wife turned left. Okay. Uh, uh, she uh, turned left, and uh, left was not where God was. Uh, I was going this way, and she wanted to go that way, left or right, whatever you want to say. But she turned a corner. And uh, I couldn't seem to get her to not come, get away from that new road that she was on. Uh, there's nothing I can do. I couldn't get her off that road. And then about four years later, uh, she ended her relationship with Jesus temporarily. Uh, she ended her ministry temporarily. She ended our uh, relationship, our marriage. She ended the marriage. That was permanent. And uh, she ended everything that she'd been doing for 16, 17 years. And uh, she went through a really hard, difficult time for many, 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 many years. Unfortunately, she's come back to the Lord. Unfortunately, she's come back to the ministry. And, uh, but, you know, uh, she's got consequences that suffered. And uh, so uh, she's never remarried. I've never remarried. I'm the husband of one wife. Uh, chose to tuck that harder, more difficult road. And because I couldn't stay in relationship with her anymore, and finally, I'll just say this too, for those who are wondering, because uh, uh, what, jo- I mean, what God joins together, God has to separate. You know, man can't separate. So I, just because a judge wants to separate you, uh, that doesn't mean a whole lot to God. Uh, uh, God has to separate that marriage. If God put the marriage together, then God has to separate it. So uh, uh, one day, uh, so I had to step down from ministry for two and a half years. I couldn't minister, I had to stop serving the Lord. And uh, just had to sit, be like everybody, you know, I just to sit in the pew and wait. And I waited for two years, two and a half years, before the Lord reinstated me in the ministry. But sometime during that uh, uh, first year, uh, I was in uh, uh, our pre our early morning, our early uh, prayer before service, and I'm pacing back and forth with a bunch of other people. We were praying, and, and uh, it was like. Uh, I, I, it was like Jesus came right up to my nose and I stopped cold in my tracks. I mean, I just stopped. I came to a screeching halt and I froze. I mean, I just literally just froze staring in the eyes of Jesus face to face, nose to nose. And I heard the Lord say, uh, uh, I am releasing you from Nancy because I cannot use you with sin in your life. I am releasing you from Nancy because I cannot use you with sin in your life. Now you can take and scoff me, you can laugh at me, you can say that wasn't real, but at that very instant, I was released from my marriage and uh, I shortly after that was reinstated in the ministry and my ministry just took off and has never stopped since then. That was uh, uh, 1994 or 95, Uh, probably uh, late 94 or early of 95. And uh, it hasn't stopped. I mean, my, mer- my relationship with the Lord just has been skyrocketing and uh, had some challenges and bumps in the, ro- in the beginning. And uh, my ministry has been nothing like it was back then. It was, it's been incredible. So the uh, 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 funny thing about that is, now here's another caveat to that, is uh, just no, right after that, right shortly after that, uh, because I was reinstated, I started joining the pastors' meetings. We had probably 20, 25 pastors would meet, and I was in there also, you know, with them. And uh, I wasn't a pastor, but you know, a minister. And uh, I think I had like three, four, or five pastors during a probably a several month period come up to me and says, "John, the, the Lord uh, has told me that you have a 
unresolved conflict in your life, and that's why your ministry is kind of plateaued. And I hope you know, do you know what that means? And I said, yes, it does, thank you. And I, like three or four times, same exact word, almost like verbatim. Uh, the Lord showed me that you have an unresolved conflict in your life, and that's why your ministry is plateaued, something like that. But I remember the unresolved conflict, and I didn't tell him what it was, because I knew what it was. I knew what it was. This might have been year four, year four after the breakup, after the divorce. And I, I got to tell you this, I don't know why, but you know, every video is different. If you don't like this, there'll be another one on Sunday, because uh, this is Friday. Um, what happened was, uh, uh, when, when my wife filed for divorce, she retracted the divorce and says, I'm going to make you file divorce. Well, I don't want the divorce. Yeah, I, don't, I, I don't want the divorce. So I waited upon the Lord. I kept my wedding ring on for two and a half years, two years and two months. I remember the day. And uh, that's when the Lord says, you know, I got to get, you know. And uh, so I waited after, the, after everything, after the Lord says, I've released you. After two and a half years, I finally took my wedding ring. I'm still standing for my marriage. And five years have gone by. And these pastors came to me. <clears throat> and I knew what they were talking about because I had... I did not want to file the divorce papers since she turned it over to me. She said, I, I, I returned that and I'm going to make you do the divorce. I said, well, I don't want it. And so I waited and waited and waited after all these pastors would come to me. And after that, there were other people in other parts of life who said something similar to me. And the Lord was dealing with me in a very uh, stern way that what he said was true. Uh, I have released you from Nancy, my wife, and uh, because I because what was happening was sin, and God couldn't use me was sin. That's what he was titling as sin. Uh, you know, you can analyze that all you want, but this is my story, okay? And uh, so uh, uh, I finally I was in Boulder preaching in Boulder because I had been reinstated to the ministry. Remember, I told you that. I'm in Boulder preaching, and the Lord just kept after me. I said, okay, Lord, that's it. I guess I cannot stand for the marriage anymore after five years of standing for my marriage. And so I contacted, I didn't want to do the paperwork. I said, I don't know what to do. So uh, the Lord led me to a, an attorney here in Boulder, and uh, I talked to him. I told the whole story to him. I said, oh, piece of cake, we'll get it all done. He did all the paperwork. I signed, I signed here, and then I went to the judge there in Boulder, the Justice Center where I stand across the street. And I remember looking at the judge, there's a lady judge, and uh, she called our case, my case, because I'm in Boulder, Nancy was in Reading. And uh, I told the judge, I said, this isn't right. I said, both of us have to agree to get married, but only one of us have to say, I don't want to get married anymore, I want to, be, I want to divorce you. And it's okay. We should both have to agree on the divorce, because I don't agree with it. I'm not in agreement with the divorce. So, uh, you know, and the judge sided with me. Maybe she's seen me around town, I'm not sure, but she agreed with me. And uh, uh, so, you know, I walked out with, you know, signed, sealed, and delivered divorce papers. Did anything change in my life? No, nothing changed in my life, because my relationship with Christ hasn't changed. It never faltered during all that breakup, all that trouble. I tell you, I had five years of misery, five years, you know? It was horrible, because that was my number one desire in life, was to, be a husband and be a father and have a family. You know, I sent. I used to send my wife uh, uh, two two cards during our anniversary, uh, that the anniversary that we're having, and a 50-year anniversary, a golden anniversary. I would celebrate both anniversaries every year. You know, I would even. I even had a a, a, a plaque, a bulletin board in our bedroom with all kinds of cards and things and notes and you know, always uh, uh, encouraging her. You know, loving on her all the time. I remember sitting in the kitchen, at the kitchen table. Sorry I'm going on this way, but I guess somebody's got to hear this because, you know, divorce is a real part of life. You know, half, 54, 53%, 51% of everybody gets divorced. You know, every other person, saved or not saved, doesn't matter if you know Jesus or don't know Jesus, they end up in divorce. So uh, this might be something somebody needs to hear. I don't know that, but I really feel moved in my spirit to say this. So I was sitting at the kitchen table, this is before the divorce, and, uh, uh, and I was just so moved with my love for my wife. And I said, Nancy, she was at the, 
uh, she was cooking dinner. She was at the kitchen sink looking out the window. She was doing something in the kitchen. I was sitting at their little round oak dining room table in the kitchen, had a large kitchen. And uh, I said, Nancy, I really love you. I sure love you. Something like that. I sure love you. I mean, it just poured out of me. I sure love you. And I remember her stopping what she was doing. And she turned to me and looked right at my eye. And she had this really weird, funny look. And I'm going, whoa. That, and I was thinking to myself, that's weird. That something's not right there. You know, a lot of guys are blind to divorce. They don't know what's happening. You know, we're working. You know, I worked 100 hours a week. I didn't know. I'm a trucker. You know, I didn't know what she was doing, but lo and behold, uh, she had been planning the divorce. And here I'm telling her how much I love her. I'd get out of the truck and I'd come straight home to be with the kids, to be with the wife. You know, we homeschooled the kids. You know, I was a dad's dad. I was a father. I was a husband. I was everything anybody wanted. I was a bread provider. My wife didn't have to go to work. I provided all the funds, all the money for our family. We had a nice big home, had a boat, two cars, had a nice lifestyle. And uh, she didn't have to work. She hadn't returned. She hadn't worked since she was 23 years old. I retired her. That's when she got married, 23. I was 25. Hang on a second. Ambulance or fire or whatever that is. Please. So, uh, lo and behold, you know, she had been planning this for four years. Unbeknownst to me, I had no clue. No clue until that very day right there. So, you know, we all have problems, we all have struggles. Are you gonna quit on Jesus because you go through a divorce? Maybe next year, you say, oh, my marriage is fantastic, we're really loving each other, but behind the scenes, Satan is at work. I ain't kidding. I, ain't, I am not fooling you. And if you just don't say anything, everything's gonna be fine, no, you gotta be talking. That's why prayer is so important. You gotta be talking to God all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. Talk to your spouse all the time. Talk to your children all the time. Always be communicating. Always be dialoguing back and forth. Always be talking to them. And uh, because you don't know what's around the next bend. That's why I give everybody on this video, I'm giving you everything you possibly need to go out and serve the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and body. Because I don't know if this will be your very last video after this message. This could be the last one. The last one. So I give it all. And if you come back again, I'll give you more. If you come back again, I'll give you more. But if this is the last one you see, last one you hear from me, uh, you have everything it takes. That's how I operate because I'm a trucker. I don't see somebody two or three times in a row. I don't come back to the same place. You know, I was, I lived on the road. You know, I see somebody and that's the last time I see them. So I give people everything, 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 everything. I'm gonna move this camera back because that sun is beating on my back. Sorry. Is that gonna work? Don't know that. We'll see what happens. And it just was beaten on the back. So uh, be alert to that, okay? Be alert to what uh, God is doing. And uh, let me turn this a little bit. I don't know. There's a tree. That's the that's the tree I'm standing under. <laughs> be alert to what God is doing in your life. And uh, be alert to what Satan is doing in your life. Is this okay? That's a tree right there. Uh, you know, I don't know. <clears throat> That's the end of that. We're going to pray now. <laughs> the Holy Spirit just said, that's it. Let's pray now. <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful? So, Lord, I just thank you for allowing me to talk uh, out of the abundance of my heart. I didn't know I was going to talk about it. It wasn't even in my thought pattern. Uh, for I, I wasn't even thinking about it, Lord. And here it is. You're having me talk about something that wasn't even in my conscious thought. So, apparently, Lord, this came out of my heart. And it, apparently, it's for somebody either now or later, who knows? Uh, but I am a vessel for you, Lord, to fill, be filled up by you, Lord, be filled up by your spirit, and to be able to be a minister of the Most High God. And I thank you, Lord, for whatever you're doing in these people's lives. Give them eyes to see, Lord. Give them ears to hear, Lord. And give them a heart to understand what's going on in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. So. Uh, Onto the home with the video. <laughs> so as you know, uh, we have structure in our ministry and the structure that we're using that the Holy Ghost gave us is our titles. We have three titles that make up a structure. That's the word I'm using. I don't have another word right now, so that's the one I'm using currently. 
So the structure is the Word of God. That's the first title. The Word of God is found in Revelation 19:13, And he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called. You got it? The Word of God. I hope you know that. And I hope you're not getting bored with that. You know, if you're getting bored by me always quoting the same verse, you may have to kind of think, rethink your relationship with the Lord. You should never get bored with the Word. You can get bored with me, that's fine. But never be war bored with the Word of God. If the Lord wants you to read one verse for the rest of your life, then read that one verse. Like we've been reading this one verse since October 10th. Then. October 10th. October, November, December, January, February, March, April. That's six months of quoting that same verse on every single video. That's a lot of times I've been quoting. That's why I've memorized it. <laughs> but if I stop quoting, I'll probably forget it. But uh, So the next verse after that the Lord gave us is uh, Breakthrough and Overcome. Got to keep an eye on things here. Breakthrough and Overcome. Uh, I found in Numbers 1330. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Hope you get that. And the next title is our Sunday prayer letter. It's our April 17th Sunday prayer. This prayer letter is titled, changes every Sunday, okay? It changes every Sunday. So this Sunday, from started yesterday, today's Friday, it is uh, the Spirit and quench not the Spirit. Found in Revelation 1.10 where, and also 1 Thessalonians 5.19. Uh, the first part of uh, Revelation 1.10 says, John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, in the spirit. Uh, he was testifying to all of us that he personally, individually, as a man of God, as a preacher, as a minister, was in the Holy Spirit of God at that moment. And he gave us revelation. <clears throat> so I hope that you are in the spirit. I, I believe that John never came out of the spirit, but he wanted to declare that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Maybe it's something special going on, obviously so. <laughs> You know, so uh, he wanted to make that declaration. There's something special going on today. I think I'm going to write uh, something's going on here because then he heard a great voice. Uh, and uh, then the next part of that is who's the Spirit of And that is uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says, uh, quench not the Spirit. Uh, and it's, that is actually uh, really important to understand that because we studied yesterday uh, that quench means to, uh, uh, to uh, extinguish, to extinct. And to extinct is to not rise up. So if you don't want the Holy Ghost to rise in your life, uh, then you just put him out. You ex you extinct him. You extinguish him. You quench the Holy Ghost. I would advise, uh, highly advise, and counsel you not to do that. But I see people do that. And why do they do it? Uh, could be because they were taught to that. The Holy Ghost is not real. It could be taught that the gifts of the Holy Ghost are gone and dead. It could be that uh, their pastor doesn't want the Holy Ghost in their church. It could be lots of things that are all from the Antichrist. Because if the Antichrist can take out the Spirit of God, which can't happen, but if they're trying, uh, then he can keep the growth of Jesus' body, the body of Christ, uh, in check. So that's why uh, he talks a lot about only a remnant, a small portion of the people will actually be saved. You know, it's not the multitudes, you know, broad is the way and everybody wants to stay out there. Uh, but narrow, very skinny, very tight. It's not hard, not difficult, because anybody can pass through it. Even a camel can get on his knees and crawl through the eye of the needle. But sometimes you have to get on your knees. <laughs> It's a, kind of a little thing. Get on your knees and pray to God. And or sometimes you got to have to turn sideways and kind of go through that door, you know. And the problem with that sometimes, if the camel was too fat, camels don't get fat, right? So they can always go through the needle. But can people get fat spiritually? How about physically? Uh, they get fat physically. Could they be spiritually fat? Could that be an outward sign of an inward problem? I don't know. But why a believer cannot go through that eye of the needle is because they're really not a believer. They are false. They're a false believer. They're a false, they're following a false Christ. Like I talked to a lot of people yesterday. You know, they had all these theology, had all this information, 
but half the people I talk to, uh, no, about a third, a little less than a third of the people I actually conversed with, the other two thirds had correct theology. But those, that one third had all kinds of goofy, stupid, idiotic, satanic, antichrist, Luciferian teaching. And they believed it was correct and it was right. And they're gonna die with it. Guess where they're gonna go? Well, they say, they tell me, they're, well, they're gonna redo it again. And if they don't do it right that time, they'll come back again and again and again and again and again until they get it right. It's called, uh, called uh, uh, reincarnation, right? Reincarnation is down in the Bible. It's an Alexandrian teaching. It's Egyptian teaching. It's an antichrist. It's anti-God. It's anti-word. That's why the Alexandrians got this Bible changed. That's why a lot of people stopped following Christ in John chapter 6, verse 66. Because Jesus put down the teaching of, uh, of uh, reincarnation coming back again and he changed it and taught he didn't change it but he taught on resurrection coming back from the dead as a you know and glorified you know. anyways a lot of people didn't like that a lot of people stopped following Jesus that's why Jesus turned to his disciples are you gonna leave too are you gonna leave too a lot of believers leave so I ask people are you leaving too you know you see anybody out here nobody's out here you know I'm I'm still here Jesus asked me, John, are you going to leave? Are you going to stay home today? No, I'm going, man. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm not leaving you. That's what the disciples, who do we go to? You have the bread of life. You have the light of God. You have the word of God. You are the Christ, the Messiah. You're the one who's going to die on the cross and shed his blood for our sins. We're going to receive eternal life because we believe on you, Jesus. We know that you are the Christ. Jesus Christ is our Messiah. And you need to know that Jesus died for you, that he shed that precious blood to wash away all your sins, to provide remission of all that sin, to give you a new life in him, to have eternal life, to go to heaven. I tell you, it's a real deal. It's not made up. We're not telling a story. We're not telling some myth or some... some uh, fairy tale it's real it is totally real that's why the the jailer at midnight fell on his knees in the dark and said sirs what must I do to be saved are you in the dark is it midnight where you are and in dark then fall on your knees and say sirs what must I do to be saved? And God will tell you what you must do. He'll say, believe on me. You can take it for what you're worth. I mean, you can just do whatever you want. I don't really care. I'm just telling you the truth, okay? You can say, well, I'm going to do that and receive Satan. Well, then go receive Satan. I don't really care. All I care about is delivering the word of God, and praying for your soul, standing in the gap for you. Because if you try to receive Satan as your Lord and your God, you're foolish and you're you're going to go to hell. You're going to die. You're going to face judgment. You're going to spend the eternity in eternal punishment, lake of fire. But as long as you're not dead, Preacher John is going to be standing in the gap for you. No question about it. I hope you know that. In Jesus' name. I'm going to do one more thing here. So in our Sunday prayer letter, we have uh, seven parts. So this is part... Uh, what is this? Part 6, Friday, Ephesians 6.16. I never know what these videos are going to be like. So, <laughs> editing is sometimes kind of hard. A lot, many, many, mo seem like half the time, it appears that way to me, but many, many, many times after I've done the video, I'm sitting there, because like, I'm out here for four or five hours to see one, two, three, four, five, I'll be here for four hours today. I'm here a couple hours late. Uh, I'll be here till about 5:30, 5:20, something like that. And uh, I think, I mean, I can't, I can't post that video. That did, video didn't make any sense. It was wrong, it was wrong, it was wrong. But then I edit, edited it, and I look at it and go, "Oh, this is really good." Last night's video, when I was editing it, I had to stop the editing twice because I couldn't stop crying. But I love Jesus, you know. 
I love Jesus, and I cry with tears of joy, not tears of sadness. I don't cry for sadness, I cry, I cry for joy. Anytime you see me cry, it's because of joy. Ephesians 6, uh, 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. We're studying on the word quench, quench not the spirit, okay? Well, here's another word for quench, another time that you could quench. Now, you want to use this word here. You want to quench this. You want to extinguish it. You want to not let it to rise up. But if you don't quench it, so here's what happens a lot of, some, some believers, not everybody, but some, they quench the Spirit of God, okay? They put the Spirit of God out, the Holy Ghost out of their life. They just want to get saved, and that's all they want. They want to go to heaven. They just want to know that, but they don't want all the Holy Ghost. They want just a tiny little dot of the Spirit of God. However, when it comes to Satan and the sin, the temptations, the fiery darts, they don't quench that. Well, what, what's all that about? It's because what you sow, you reap. That's what it's about. If you quench the Spirit, then you're going to reap not quenching the devil. Seems kind of weird to say that that way. Never thought about that before. Never said that before. I uh, just said it just now. So Jesus took the seed of not of quenching because that seed should have been to not quench the spirit. But instead, you perverted that seed, you perverted that calling, you perverted the word of God and said, I am going to quench, I am going to grieve the spirit. And over here was Satan got flipped around and now you're not grieving Satan. You're not quenching the devil. You're not putting out the fiery darts of the enemy. Something to think about, man. I mean, something to really ponder on, question. Let me read this one more time. Ephesians 6, 16. We all kind of know it's all about the armor of God, but I'm only highlighting this because of the word quench. Above all, that should catch your attention. If you just breeze right over, above all, hey, you know, no, stop right there. Above all, think about that. Above all, so here's above, and then you have to go a little higher up to be all, to include, like I can reach up here. I'm above the camera, but I'm not above the tree. The tree keeps going up, but guess what's above the tree? That, uh, this light pole over here, that light pole over here is above the tree. What's above that tree? That building over there, what's above that building? Well, you know, I don't know, clouds. <laughs> what's above the clouds? Well, the sky, what's above the sky? The universe, what's above the universe? Heaven, <clears throat> you know? Huh. Well, who's in heaven? God. <laughs> so, above all, taking the shield of faith. So if you don't take it, if taking also implies that you don't have to take it. Think about that. A lot of us don't take up the armor of God. I put the armor of God every single day, seven days a week, or at least six days a week. I don't know if I do it on Saturdays because I'm at home. But, you know, probably should. <laughs> I, don't, I think I do. But I'm more pronounced when I'm on the street. I put on the whole armor of God. Above all, taking the shield of faith. You need faith. When Peter got out of the boat, <clears throat> Peter was moved by the word of God. The word of God said, come. Peter said to the Word of God, call me, or is that you, or whatever he said. I don't know what the Bible says, but something like that. He said something to Jesus, and Jesus said, come on, man, get out of the boat. I'm over here, or whatever he said. And Peter got out of the boat, and Peter walked on the water. That's what the Bible says. Peter walked on the water. That is uh, mathematically impossible. So people who are trying to understand Christ with their mind, they're going to miss all that. They're going to miss that. Jesus Christ is the Word of God, is Almighty God. And that God, Almighty God, died for you in the form of the body of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man. Mother was Mary. His dad was the Father God, Almighty God, Jehovah. His dad was not Mary's fiance, soon to be Mary's husband, and soon to be the Father of of Jesus' brothers and sisters. But they're half brothers. <laughs> Above all, taking the shield of faith. Wherewith, so let's finish the story on Mont Peter. 
So Peter walked on the water. And guess what Peter did? Did he walk all the way over to Jesus like Jesus told him to do? Come over here. No, he stopped part way. I don't know how far he walked. I don't know how long it was. It doesn't matter. But he looked down. He looked away from Jesus and looked down at the earth, looked down at the world, and began to sink. When you turn your eyes away from Jesus, away from the Word of God, and you look down to the world and look at your life, you begin to sink. And if you keep on sinking, you've got problems on the horizon that are going to devastate your life. I'm going to kind of put a little caveat right in there, and I'm going to go back to the original story about uh, Nancy and I, my wife. And uh, this is part that you have to understand also. A lot of people don't get this. But uh, the Lord showed me a woman I was to marry, and I said no to God. Don't say no to God. I said no to God for that woman and uh, married somebody else. And we didn't marry because of love. We married because of business. And five hours, five hours, exactly five hours, I looked at my watch. Five hours after we said I do to each other in the church, she said, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have married you. I'll file for annulment when we get back from our honeymoon. So we went on honeymoon right after we left the church. And she did, we got back two weeks later, and uh, she immediately, that day, left and filed for annulment. And her grandma and her mom, dad, talked her out of it. So she spent the next 16, 17, 16 and a half years, 15 and a half, 16 years with me. It had to have been a horrible experience for her because she knew she made a mistake. And that's why she finally couldn't take it any longer. She had to deal with it. So, I mean, you know, uh, people marry the wrong people. People do things they shouldn't do. I, I, you know, that's why I wanted to bring that story back into this story. Peter took his eyes off of God. If I, I took my eyes, I remember I was on a stage, I was in the praise and worship team, and I took my eyes off the Lord and put it on the world, and I began to sink. And I so, I've asked 10,000 times, it seems like, repenting of that and asking forgiveness, because it really just, uh, really changed my whole life course uh, uh, you know it was really tough on me but uh, oh this wind sorry uh, but fortunately for Peter he was right there next to Jesus because Jesus reached down and pulled him up but Jesus rebuked him by saying oh ye of little faith that's a rebuke I mean, I don't care how you look at it. To me, it looks like a rebuke. It's always sounded like a rebuke to the, the moment I read that a long time ago to today. It still, to me, sounds like a rebuke that Jesus gave to Peter. Oh, ye of little faith. And I think he said ye, Y-E. I don't remember exactly. I don't think it could have been thee, but, you know, being singular, he was talking directly to Peter. But if he said ye of little faith, if he said the word Y in there, that was plural, it means he was talking to everybody in the boat. All of us right now, all of us have little faith. That's why it says, take, above all, taking up the shield of faith. Field of faith, man. We, the just shall live by faith. I can't harp that enough. Faith, 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 faith. When faith began to really rise on planet Earth during the 80s, the word of faith movement got huge. And people began to pervert it. They began to take it for themselves and pervert the message and that when they began to pervert it and take it for themselves away from the glory of God and to glorify themselves because then they began to think that well we have the word of faith we don't need God anymore and after many 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 years uh, all that became a problem in the body of Christ but during that time there were many many denominations all over the world putting down the word of faith they didn't put down the corruption they put down the entire word of faith. So the word of faith was rising for all of us to have, because Paul says, I preach the word of faith. But, but because people don't want to receive the word of faith, 
they were squelching, they were quenching the spirit. And in that quenching, instead of receiving the word of faith and rebuking the corruption in the word of faith, they didn't do that. They didn't, they just, re, they just rebuked all of the word of faith. I mean, how sad, right? When the prosperity gospel took off and God wanted to prosper his people, you know, prosperity started to rise in the body of Christ. And then guess what happened? People took it for themselves again. That's what happens when the move of God happens. They take it to themselves. Oh man, this is so wonderful. Uh, we've got it now. We don't need you anymore, God. Uh, we've got the word of faith. Uh, we got prosperity. We, we don't need you anymore, God. Thank you. See what happened? They quench the spirit and, they, and then it corrupts and all that falls. And so over here, all many more denominations putting down the prosperity gospel, putting down the, the, the God wanted to prosper and build up his people. But they quenched the spirit. And that's why there's so much perversion there. I tell you, that's why when Jesus calls and says to come, I almost believe, don't know for a fact, but I almost see that they're going to quench that spirit. And they're going to suffer through the tribulation because they don't want to receive the being caught away. They don't want to receive it. But I preach it. I believe it. I see it in the scriptures. I understand it. And I'm listening. I'm waiting for God to call me. But others who quench that move of the Spirit to get ready, Jesus is coming. Listen, 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 listen. I've got ears to hear. I'm ready now. I'm not waiting around. I don't need to go do something. I'm ready right now. <laughs> if you sell my lift, you know. But others are quenching the Spirit. They're putting that down. Guess what? They're going to go through the tribulation. And they're going to say, see, I told you we're going to have to go through it. I told you that uh, rapture stuff was no good. That's why people turn me off. They turn anybody off who wants to preach that pray that your flight be not in winter. Pray that you uh, be not at midnight. Pray that it not be on the Sabbath. That's what I'm praying. Doesn't matter. People can twist it and turn it all they want. And you can... God's going to let, the Bible says in Mark 11, 24, let me read that one. I'm, I go this a lot, and then we'll go into prayer. Mark 11, 24. Mark 11, 24. This applies to those who want to believe it and applies to those who do not want to believe it. Are you ready? 11, 24. Therefore, this is Jesus speaking, the word of God, the word of God over our banner, the banner over us, the word of God, Jesus Christ. His name is called the word of God, all right? Jesus said, therefore I say unto you, all of you, all of us, I'm gonna tell you something, listen up. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Just like that. I'm going to say it again, a little faster. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. I'm going to say it again. Therefore, uh, this must be. Therefore, I say unto you, you, the one who's listening right now, and me, I'm listening. I've got ears to hear. If you got ears to hear, hear this. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Is this the Word of God? Well, some people say no. It's perverted. Some people say no. This is a corrupt text. Some people don't believe this is the Word of God. They believe the ESV is the Word of God. Or the New King James Bible. I, I don't go. Does, do whatever you want to do. doesn't matter. I don't care, man. But I'm going to tell you this. It says right here. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever ye desire... Did I come here? When you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. What things? It, it didn't put a category on that. You said, well, you're taking that out of context. Look, this isn't out of context. It's in the Bible. <laughs> it is still in the Bible. I didn't tear it out. I didn't cross it out. I didn't blot it out like they did in Acts 8.37. They just blot that out. Or Mark... Uh, 16, 9 through 20. They just blot that out. 
That didn't exist. That's not blotted out. I didn't blot it out. So when you pray, believe that you receive it. Even if you don't pray, if you believe something, you're going to receive it. That's why you have to check on the things that you believe. If you believe that speaking in the unknown language, unknown being unknown to man, is of Satan, then you're going to receive what you believe. I praise God that I can magnify Almighty God in a heavenly language that I can go for hours and 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 never end and never repeat myself twice. But when you pray in English, you can't go hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, never shutting up and never repeating yourself. You're going to repeat yourself over and over and over and over again. But in the spirit language, you won't repeat yourself. It is it's an unlimited language, unlimited. God is unlimited. Our language on earth is limited. It's just finite. That's why all that's going to be done away with. I mean, but people want to believe what they want to believe. True or not, doesn't make any difference. Doesn't matter if God wants you to have that or not. If God wants you to have prosperity and you rebuke that, then you're not going to have prosperity. If, you, if God wants to heal you physically and you don't believe that, then God's not going to heal you. If you don't want to be saved, God's not going to save you, man. If you want to go to hell, guess where you're going to go? You're going to go to hell. I mean, it's just the way it is. You can believe and receive whatever you want. It's an open book. What things? But pay attention now. Beware. Paul said, don't be ignorant to the devices of Satan. Now, what does that mean? If you have lust, and you lust after this car right here that's parked right beside me and you just crave that car you have drawings of that car you look at all the websites of that car you have brochures of that car you have everything cut out and on your dream board is pictures of this car right here and you're lusting you're craving after that car guess what you have an idol in your life and that car becomes an idol and God said there's gonna be no idols before me something like that and you you sense God's presence moving out of your life. It won't leave you, but you sense it moving away. And you replace that presence with your spirit. And you begin to prophesy out of your spirit. You begin to read the Bible out of your spirit. You begin to preach out of your spirit. You begin to believe from your spirit. And God says, I didn't tell you to do that. I didn't tell you to do that, 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 and that. That's your spirit. It's your brain, your spirit. It has nothing to do with me. You can believe that or not believe it. It's up to you, not me. I, I know what I believe. Huh. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that we can believe and we can receive. Uh, and by faith, uh, we can understand the Word of God. We can understand the move of the Spirit. And by faith, you teaching us, Holy Spirit, how not to quench you, how not to grieve you, how not to put you out, to extinguish you, to keep you down, to keep you under our feet. You can teach us how not to do that. You can teach us to, to repent from that. And I thank you, Holy Ghost, that you're teaching us the word of truth. You're the spirit of truth. And you're teaching us all the things that Jesus has taught us in the word, has taught us in our own walk with Jesus, and is gonna to continue to remind us of all the things that Jesus has taught, even me and those who are watching, Lord. And Father, we give you all the glory, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And we praise you, Almighty God. We praise you and we glorify you, Almighty God. In your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. So, uh, praise God. It's a good video. So uh, tomorrow is my Sabbath, that's Saturday. I don't preach on Saturdays. I stay home with the Lord. I rest in the Lord. Sabbath is the seventh day. And tomorrow is my seventh day. And I rest on that day. Today is my sixth day. And I work for six days. And I rest on the seventh. And I rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then later in that afternoon, the Holy Spirit moves me. And I wait upon. I wait. I don't just run out and do it. Uh, sometimes I wish I could. But sometimes I have to wait a long time. Last Sunday, it was late. It was probably 9 o'clock that night when I finally finished the right sentence. I was so exhausted I couldn't do a podcast. I couldn't do a live stream because I kept waiting. And I'm not going to do something on my own. Forget it. I'd rather not even write or do anything. I would just go to bed. 
I'm not gonna do anything out of my spirit because God's never gonna tell me, John, you should, you know, I've already been that way, okay? I've already, I know what it looks like to follow your spirit. I know what it looks like. So tomorrow is the Sabbath and I'm gonna rest in the Lord. And I'm later on that day, I'm gonna write the Sunday prayer letter. Hopefully I'll have enough time to do the podcast, reading the Sunday prayer letter. And hopefully after that, I'll have enough time to do the uh, live stream on YouTube, uh, broadcast, live broadcasting, uh, reading the Sunday prayer letter to those who wanna watch me, read. <laughs> yeah. uh, hopefully I'm gonna share, I'm gonna do something a little different this week because I'm trying to shorten the Sunday prayer letter down at the top, but I'm gonna keep the rest of it. So uh, yeah. At the end of the video. God bless you, man. I love you very much. Take care. Bye-bye.